John, chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The higher hand, who is not the sheep, the shepherd, and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The higher hand runs away because a higher hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, for I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father, the word of the Lord. Please be Good morning. As many of you may know by now, before coming to Peachtree, Jordan and I used to work in Valencia, Spain as college ministers and missionaries. Now, every time I mention Jordan in a sermon, she's always afraid that it would be confusing in case someone doesn't know who she is. So, for the sake of this story, Jordan is my wife. Strictly for the sake of this story. While my wife, Jordan, and I were there. We had two college students, uh, Daniel and Gloria, who became two very good friends of ours. And Daniel and Gloria were from China, and they were studying in Valencia. They weren't Christians, uh, but they became part of our community, our ministry, that is called Zero. They showed up to nearly every event, and they grew to know people and grew to become core members of our community. They were still very connected with other Chinese students who studied in the area. And because of that, they ended up starting a uh, tradition at in vivo of celebrating Chinese New Year. Uh, and even when they couldn't be there sometimes, uh, during COVID, they were stuck in China for a while, we continued on the tradition of having Chinese New Year and connecting with Chinese students who didn't normally come to in vivo at all. And in their first year, they won the coveted Servant Award by doing literally everything and treating in vivo as if it was their own and serving others. So why, in preaching on Jesus as a good shepherd, do I tell you about my two Chinese friends who aren't Christian? That's a very interesting question. You're very deaf. I'm proud of you this morning. Another interesting question. Why is the church so obsessed with shepherds? Do you know a shepherd? Okay. Well, you don't count sheep. The rest of you, you guys know shepherds? Am I the only one who doesn't know shepherds? All right. Apparently, we're all doing the shepherds. I thought we were in Midtown Atlanta, but apparently, out in the field. But we don't know many shepherds. But we cling to a scripture that is full of this shepherding imagery. We have Jesus with shepherds all over our Every single one of you, don't lie, has seen that picture of Jesus with the sheep on its back. His head turned white. You get a little confused on which way the sheep's looking, but it's right there. You all seen the picture. And there in today's text, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Another of our readings from the lectionary, so this is going to be like a magic piece or something, yeah. All right, so your order of worship, right here. That first page, I want you to look at it. You haven't looked at this since the first time it looked like this, because it's never changed, right? Now, at the bottom, this is the magic trick. Every single week, we change these readings, all right? Which one of you all read them? Sinner. Every single week, we have different readings done there, including this John passage, but also a rare psalm that's never been heard before. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. God, I want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He 
restores my soul. For his name's sake, and even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff that comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and you anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. It's a beautiful, comforting word, even if you don't know a shepherd. When, when's the last time you heard of anybody have a occasion they've heard that song before? Every funeral you've ever been to? Every single one. It's just so, such a comforting image. We have Jesus as shepherd, the shepherd who leaves the 99 to go find the one. And Ezekiel, God finds himself in the shepherd. He says he will seek the lost and bring back the strayed. Some of the most famous people in Scripture and throughout Christian history have been shepherds. We have Moses, shepherd. King David, shepherd. The shepherd of Hermes, probably a shepherd. I look him up. He seems legit. So what is it about shepherds? It seems pretty clear in these verses we read here. It's their love. It's their compassion. It's their caring for those in need, specifically us as the sheep. But what we sometimes forget as we rest in the security and this grace and this love of our good shepherd is that he has called the sheep to follow us and to go where he goes and to act as he acts. When we read Psalm 23, we think of Jesus walking with us through the valley of the shadow of death. We don't think about the fact that we are sometimes following Jesus into the valley of the shadow of death. He's leading us there. If we trust and follow the Good Shepherd, we are called to be the Good Shepherd to others. If you look just before this, uh, in John 10.10, Jesus talks about the abundant life. And then he talks about a shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. This abundant life that Jesus talks about is filled with love and caring for others' needs and letting go of our own preferences for the good and the comfort of others. And when our cup runneth over, that goodness and mercy, that is for others. That is a gift that we give out of the goodness that we have received. Every week, we practice communion and we remember that we are united as the body of Christ to serve as Christ serves, to love as Christ loves. And sometimes when we think about this laying down our lives, right, it's hard to think of images that aren't just like extraordinary. I think of Desmond Doss, portrayed by Andrew Garfield, who plays every type of Christian ever. If you just go through his list, every single type of Christian. But Andrew Doss, as Desmond Doss, was a Latter-day Saint who would not speak during World War II. He was a field medic, and he would only run into the battle and go grab people. He wouldn't carry a weapon. If you saw the movie Hacksaw Ridge, the movie was about his effort to save his comrade. But, in another one of these mysterious lectionary texts that just appeared for the first time, I'm sure, in 1 John 3, it anticipates that disconnect that we have with this, well, lay down my life. I mean, I'll do it theoretically. Luckily, it's never come up. And it says, if you have any needs and you see someone who needs it, where are you showing love if you're not helping? That one hits a little closer to home. I, there's rarely a day you can drive to church and not see someone in need. And the more you get to be united and connected as a group and a community, we will see the needs of others, whether those needs are material or whether they are the needs of our time and our love. I've seen it in this church. I've seen the shepherding. Every Tuesday, we have respite ministry, and I see people who give up their time and serve and care for those who are struggling with Parkinson's and other mental crimes. I know 
People in the church who stopped to help people in car wrecks and waited three hours only to drive them home out of their own way to care for them, to show that love, that sacrificial love. Or inviting people over for dinner to bring them into the family more and more. I don't know what you're thinking. That's great. That sounds really good. Good shepherd. Nailing it. But what was that weird story about the Chinese people, Daniel and Gloria, at the beginning that seemed to have nothing to do with the rest of the sermon? That's a good point. You guys are really on it this morning. I'm loving the energy. There we go. That's because the words that struck me most from this passage of chapter or verse 16. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold, and I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so that there will be one flock and one shepherd. What does that even mean? Does that mean that maybe there's some people in God who don't look like what we think they look like? They might vote Republican or Democrat or no the odds that you can be a Christian and something that I completely disagree with. There is so much that we have to learn isn't as important. What is important is that we lay down our lives for one another and love one another. When we were in Valencia, our ministry a community that we founded was to care for Spanish college students. But a common thing happens when you try and make a welcoming community. People who you aren't looking for, people who aren't your target audience, feel welcome, would feel welcome and they stay. So our ministry tended to be about 50% Spanish and 50% international. When we went to Spain, we weren't expecting that. We weren't expecting. We were expecting to minister to Spanish students. But we had a ministry that connected worldwide. And Daniel and Gloria, they didn't fit our model. They didn't fit our mold exactly. Came and were welcomed and connected. And they listened to the voice of Jesus and they started to emulate him. And they acted like shepherds. They are the sheep of a different fold. They are part of the same flock. One of my favorite stories is that Gloria uh, told this at the end of her first year with us. She said she had thought about going to study in another city, but after getting to know the Indivo community and becoming part of it, she couldn't imagine going anywhere else. And that's like the dream thing you want to hear. And then she said, I wish there could be an in vivo in China. To which Daniel quickly went, that would be wildly illegal. She never missed a beat. So how are we going to know that people are from another fold? If we don't first give them a chance to welcome them and let them bring their different foldiness into ours and affect us and change us as we sacrifice our preferences at times. And then we are going to know them by how they give of their lives, and they will know us by how we give of ours. 